Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jana Bromberg. Uh, Jana is new to Emory and uh, holds a joint appointment in the departments of biology and computer science. I uh, had the pleasure of talking to Jana a few weeks ago to understand her work. Uh, a lot of her work uh, is in the application of computational techniques, uh, deep learning in particular, uh, to look at the microbiome and its function functionality. Uh, so, uh, you know, and so, uh, Jana, I think you have an appointment also in Germany, right? Uh, at, the, at an institute in Germany, is, am I right? I do at the Technical University of Munich, yes. Yes, so, uh, so, that, so we have a lot of connections also with uh, the German Diabetes Institute. So there's a lot of connections we have. So, uh, you know, without much ado, the whole idea here is for us to learn from about Jana's work and also see where there are potential linkages for those of us working in diabetes and cardiometabolic diseases. So uh, why don't you, uh, you know, you can talk for 40 minutes, 45 minutes and try to allow some time for questions. It always helps if you can. Thank you for the introduction, Venkat. Um, I, this talk is not going to be very diabetes oriented, but I hope you guys see where you can use the things that we do for uh, the study of diabetes. There are some connections that I will make, but I'm sure that you, you know better <laughs> what needs to happen. Okay, so um, so uh, I like to start my presentation nice and slow. This is the first graph that you're going to see. There's gonna be a, a few more, but not too much. Um, this is a really good visualization how a talk is supposed to go. So the y-axis here is the amount of understanding that you should have over the time that I'm speaking. Hopefully I won't be speaking for an hour, but um, the basic idea is that you start with 100%. It's not a too steep a drop and it never gets down below 50%. This is how most talks look. I want to avoid that as much as possible because then I'm just talking to myself. So please ask me questions while I'm speaking rather than waiting for the end to actually um, chime in. So very briefly, the things that we study in my lab is the uh, function. So the word function means very different things to very different people. And that's one of the things that we study. <laughs> but we look at the function as encoded by the human genome. So variants in the human genome that lead to the changes in molecular functionality, uh, the microbiome, obviously. And we're also interested in the origins of life. So how did biological questions, biological life come about? I don't know that there is another life, but that's <laughs> that's what we deal with right now. Okay, so believe it or not, these are all interconnected. So if something pops up in the middle of my talk that's related to other things, that's on purpose. Okay, so what is protein function? So different people, protein function is different things. Um, biologically, it's something useful that a protein does. Okay? Um, that's catalysis or structural support or cell signaling, uh, transport, or you can define it as pathways or modules or whatever else, or you can define it in the very pure molecular function terms. And I'm sure there's people uh, that would argue that this is a very pure way of defining molecular function, but um, uh, you can define it as a molecular function, like what is actually happening on the molecular level or a biological process or cellular component. And depending on what you're reading or what you're studying, you're going to have a different definition of what function is. So when I talk about function, I mostly talk about molecular function. Uh, but any one protein can have very many functional labels across all of these functions, but also across different molecular functions. So computationally, when we talk about molecular functions or functions in general, we only focus on some aspects of it. We can't talk about everything that just doesn't work. So we have to focus on some aspects and by definition, it's going to be incorrect, right? So the idea that you can take a small piece of something, focus only on that, and this way describe everything doesn't work in biology. So that's why there is always exceptions to every rule, because people try to focus on one thing, and it's never one thing. Okay. Um, function, as we talk about it, may be structurally defined. 
So you can talk about protein structure domains. You could talk about unstructured regions. You can talk about uh, uh, sequence definitions, so homologues, right? So these two genes are homologous to each other, therefore they share a function, which is a very big question that um, often arises. Um, and then you can talk about per residue function. So if you're, let's say, focused on drug binding, right? You're gonna talk about the individual residues that actually define the functionality of a particular protein. And so uh, this is all very vague, and even if I try to make it more precise, I won't be able to. We just don't, we can't, right? So this is a visualization of, of how I see, you know, Tamagotchi here, <laughs> that, that we can um, explore the space of molecular functionality, right? So I don't know that it's correct 50-50. That's probably incorrect as a number, right? So, but the idea is that most molecular function, well, not most, Half of molecular function we know, and half of molecular function we don't know. And what that means is that we haven't seen a protein do this. So therefore, we cannot define, it, right? That's a that's a very um, open world problem, right? So the known proteins are falling like somewhere here. So for most proteins, we expect that the function that they do we actually know, right? But there are some proteins that could be doing something we don't know yet, right? And this is particularly true of proteins of bacteria that hang out in super inhospitable regions of the world, right? So if you think about hydrothermal wind bugs, how do they make it over there, right? So nobody knows. And, and this is actually something that's of, of really big interest to, to us as a lab. Okay, so... This subsection of known proteins is proteins that have been experimentally annotated or are homologous or obviously homologous to other proteins that have been experimentally annotated. So it's a very small space. Um, and I will talk about it later, but um, most people don't recognize how much, how little annotation actually exists, actual experimental annotations. So there are only about 15,000 proteins that have been experimentally annotated for their functionality. Everything else we infer on the basis of how homo they look, homologous um, structure and so on and so forth to known annotated proteins. Okay, so the primary focus of computational prediction methods of function is here. So we wanna annotate the proteins that we've seen because we care about the ones that we've actually seen, right? Uh, with the functions that we know, because we can't really annotate functions we don't know, right? Um, and uh, this part over here is orphan proteins, right? And so orphan proteins are the ones that have no known homologs and possibly have limited um, similarity to known functions. Right? So... The problem is that there is now, to quote some people, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? And um, the, the focus of computational methods is here in this red space, but there is this whole world out there, right? That we have to do something with, and we don't know how to do it. So uh, we can ask a question, do our tools work to annotate these? and probably my lab is actually working on it, but we have no answers <laughs> as of yet. All right, so this is the functional space. Just keep it in mind. This is like as a setup for the rest of this talk. Okay. Um, another set of setups that I wanted to, to talk about is deep learning in biology, right? So Eric Topol, uh, the director of Scripps Research Translational Institute had said in 2022, that this is the singular and momentous advance in life science that demonstrates the power of AI, right? So he is talking about AlphaFold. This is a very big statement to make, right? So this little dot over there that's in purple is the experimentally determined PDB structures in 2022. There were 190,000 PDB structures. In fact, when I was teaching bioinformatics, I would tell people like, this is such a tiny little fraction. We have so many more sequences. We can't really do anything with them. But guess what? Um, we can 
we, we got a release in 2022 of the original AlphaFold database, which was 1 million structures, right? So when the first AlphaFold paper came out, it had 1 million structures attached to it. So that's a five-fold increase. Now, 190,000 experimentally determined structures took us 30 years. So from 1979, okay, yeah, 30 years uh, to, to assemble. And then AlphaFold in a period of six months <laughs> generated that million. And then in the period of the next six months generated 200 million, right? And now uh, we are at a billion, right? Thanks to AlphaFold, but also to all of these other methods that are out there. And so this was indeed uh, a big thing. I don't know if the singular and most momentous advance, but sure, it's a, it's a biggie, right? Why uh, is it a biggie? Because we've been doing structure prediction, but not at this speed. So what it means is that we were trying to go from a sequence to a structure. Sequence, we can sequence any genetic material. We can guess on the protein sequence from that genetic material. And then what? And this was a, a way of recognizing structure. So uh, this is the technical illustration of what uh, the alpha fold underpinnings look like. And uh, the biggest point here, I guess, is this Eva former block that they have, um, which is a optimization or a fitting of a natural language processing machine learning algorithm that you guys currently know as uh, probably know as chat GPT, right? <laughs> but uh, that, that was a version of it. It's not this thing. It's a, a version of the same technical um, thing, right? And what it does is that it learns the language of the protein sequence, right? So AlphaFold learned the language of the multiple sequence alignment of structures, of, of sequences. Um, that it needed to make a prediction of structure off. But we don't have to actually look at the multiple sequence alignment. This is an expensive step. And there are lots of, as I said, orphan proteins, things that don't have families to make sequence alignments of. So in fact, we don't have to do it. We can use things like RGN that just focuses on sequence, doesn't actually have to use a multiple sequence alignment. You can take one sequence, translate it using this language model, I mean, a BERT language model, and then use that as a structure prediction mechanism. So I think the single most, the biggest thing, the most momentous advance, this miracle over here, right, is exactly that, is the ability to take an input sequence, right, and translate it into a latent space, into a set of numbers, that describes this sequence much better than our language of M's and A's and S's. That's, that's the idea, right? So the real advance, however you do it, whether you do it with an EVA former or some other transformer or anything else, right, is to go from this space, this, it's actually non-linear, but we like to think of it as a linear space, right? So these are letters, but they're not letters. They're chemical symbols. They're they, they mean something, they, they act in a particular way that's well-defined by chemistry and biophysics, right? Um, but we accept them as these letters, these building blocks. Well, the reality of it is that these building blocks can be described better in a way that is more informative, definitely of structure, right? So there are Yana, certain... Yana, Venkat, you insist to ask you a question. Yes. Uh, Please do. You know, this is really my own stupidity, but I want to expose it. Uh, so this, uh, this, this bridge, if you like, this translation, mm -hmm. you know, what were the steps involved in, in, in making that transition? And, and, you know, how did, how did it happen from the... The transition from sequence to vector space? Yes, to vector yes, space? yes, yes. Uh, it for alpha fold or for yeah for alpha fold. Let's start with alpha fold. So what all did they have to do to do that? I so I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but we're talking about a neural network that has multiple um, layers uh, that that together can be trained to produce uh, a vector space. I I feel like I'm 
I can't do this very briefly. Okay. <laughs> and I okay. don't have the time to, to do okay. it. Okay. Okay. So no, basically, my, my fundamental question was going back to your earlier slide also. Uh, what are the, if you like, the science and mathematical, you know, you know, approaches needed to make that transition, you know, from Okay. From the single um, proteins to the sequence of proteins and from the sequence of uh, networks to vector space, what does it take? So mathematically, uh, these are the same uh, steps that we're talking about training. So you have to train the model to recognize what is the full diversity of, let's say, in this protein space of protein sequences and structures and how the two correspond. Okay. Right? So um, the, the whole transformer architecture, the 2017 uh, paper on the architecture of transformers, the, the one with the attention is all you need, I believe is called, um, that method focused on the fact that there, you need to focus on specific words within uh, a sentence. This is a natural language processing in order to be able to generate the meaningful uh, understanding in quotes of the what the sentence is right okay. um and so the same sort of uh, approach is applied here to the sentence that is the the letters of the of the sequence of the protein sequence right okay. so if i give this model the billions of protein sequences that we are aware of the model recognizes the patterns in arrangements of the letters not just sequentially, but also in space over longer spans, right? Yep. And those blocks, those arrangements of letters is not something that's new for every protein. It's something that's somehow more standardized. So we don't question um, the isoleucine structure because that's the isoleucine structure that, as we know, right? So you could talk about uh, superstructures of sequences, uh, of sequence of letters in order to describe the sentence that is the protein. Does that make it better or? Yeah, definitely makes it better. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. The multiple sequence alignment, yes. So why is it not required anymore? Right, so the multiple sequence alignment. So when you think about the multiple sequence alignment, that's um, a lot of biology has been done on profiles, right? So basically what is the frequency of every letter in um, every position of a protein on the basis of the alignments across the family, right? So the assumption underlying the logic of using multiple sequence alignments is that evolution is like a, a experimental lab. So over billions of years, it has tried everything that uh, it could and things that couldn't happen, or it's not that they couldn't happen, it's just that they never made it, right? So there was a, a pressure to eliminate that from the population. So when you look at the multiple sequence alignment, you can inform your understanding of what is allowed and what is not allowed for that particular protein, for that particular sequence, right? So if we're talking about giving yourself a head start in understanding what a sequence means, multiple sequence alignments are actually great to do this, right? But if you're talking about using billions and billions of proteins, then potentially you don't actually need to use a particular family to guide your alignment. You can do that, yeah. Yeah? I'm missing the structure database where you have to give the coordinates of the Yes, that's right. And so there are some uh, issues that are lost somewhere here, but the idea is that structure has to be translatable in, sp in space, right? So if I take the 3D coordinates of a particular amino acid and I move the structure over, the structure hasn't changed, right? But the numbers representing the 3D coordinates have. And so there is some logic that needs to go into the machine learning that allows the machine to recognize that moving a structure over doesn't change the structure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So bottom line is that you can go from the sequence arrangement to this number arrangement representing a particular sequence. 
Is was there a question online or am I? No. No. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna take you back a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry that this is taking much longer than I expected, but I'm gonna take you a little bit back to what I think, and this is not necessarily true, but what I think is the reason why why this particular thing works for protein structure prediction. So there was this guy, Cyrus Leventhal, 1969, those of you who, you who remember biophysics or biochemistry, Cyrus Leventhal said that um, there is a paradox here. So if we were looking at protein folding in nature, right, with, to take 100 amino acids and try to fold them, 100 amino acids, that's 99 peptide bonds, 198 uh, five psi angles, right? And therefore, if we take three versions, those so three abilities of the five psi bond angles to appear, that's three to the power of 190 <laughs> formations. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Um, one confirmation, let's assume that uh, naturally a protein can switch between confirmations once per picosecond, picosecond, one to the negative 12th of a second, right? So that means that in order to establish this, uh, I need about 10 to the 74 years, right? So just for your comparison, um, each of the universe is 10 to the 10th. So this is a, a little more time than you would want a protein to fold, right? So Cyrus Levenzel had said to accomplish microsecond folding, which is how long it takes, Folding uh, has to be non-exhaustive and non-random, right? And so just because we don't see what is the pattern that's supposed to be captured doesn't mean that this pattern doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And so folding is sped up by rapid, simultaneous formation of local sequence interaction. So small little pieces that fold by themselves at the same time, right? And then the whole structure is formed by a bigger folding, right? So basically, if you think about it, 100 amino acids is 10 blocks of 10. And 10 blocks of 10, one forms in 3 to the 18th conformations. And then you have to arrange the, the pieces together. So that's two times that, basically. And in the end, that happens to be a microsecond time frame. Right? And if that's the case, and if we're talking about these little pieces folding together first, uh, so Berezovsky and Trifonov had said 25 to 30 amino acids. We did the work in the last year that, that showed it 16 to 24 amino acids, but actually it's probably more like 10 amino acids. So it's, it's probably even smaller than that. And so these local subsequences are likely these core words of the folding language. This is the stuff that the machine learns. This latent space is what is defined by these words, right? And so once it learns it, it can predict structure, right? But there is a problem with mapping structure to function, because we are interested in function, not in structure. So function prediction may not benefit from this, if that's the case, because A, defining cutoff of what is considered structurally similar is very difficult. And if that's the case, we, once you define the cutoff, at any cutoff almost, you could say that structurally different proteins may perform the same function and structurally similar proteins may have different functions. That happens all the time, right? But more importantly, if we just focus on humans, for example, 30% of the human proteins are disordered. They have no structure. And also what happens is that we don't know how to annotate these because most disordered proteins are not annotated. Okay, so for function, this may be more complicated. And what Prabhat had shown is that all of these wonderful methods for predicting protein function, the deep learning methods, deep fry, deep, everybody likes to use the word deep when we talk about deep learning, um, they're basically random. If you try to figure out proteins that you haven't seen before. Now, if you've seen the protein before, if you if it's homologous to something, you can figure out, but that's not interesting because we could do that for the past 40 years, right? So what is it that we're getting is not very clear. Okay, um, and another thing was that, you know, at the structure level being not very structurally similar. So everything below this cutoff, it's basically below random. So we can only do predictions for things that are structurally similar, okay. So while structure prediction has benefited immensely from deep learning, function prediction is not there yet. 
Um, and so now I want to talk about the microbiome and you'll see how that relates. So first of all, we showed a while back that 16S RNA, which is a favorite way of describing microbiomes for many people, doesn't work. Um, the reason it doesn't work is because if you look at 97% cutoff of sequence similarity in 16S RNA, you see that 55% of the organisms above this cutoff are actually of different species, right? And organisms that are of the same species, 15% of the time, they have less than 97% sequence similarity, right? So if you were to annotate organisms on the basis of 16S RNA in the metagenome data, you would probably be wrong a lot of the time, right? Um, it, even at the 100%, that doesn't really help, right? So 75% of the same species have less than 100% sequence identity. All right, so the bottom line here is that just because Barf the dog has three eyes, which is about the same as Katie and Justin, doesn't mean that he's part of the family, of the Vitus family here. So just one number is not gonna describe what this organism is. Okay, so what do people do? People try to annotate uh, microbiomes using metagenomic profiling or whole metagenome sequencing. So you shotgun the metagenomes and you get the data out and you try to assemble these into complete um, genomes. And this is basically what it looks like. That's my favorite library in the world. This is the Trinity College Library. Um, if I was to try to figure out what is written in those textbooks according to the way that we do metagenome analysis, I would first shred every book, then I would read little pieces of the text that's there, then use lots and lots of computing to reassemble it back together, and then in the end I would get two books, usually the most common books that are available in that library. So this is very um, unpleasant <laughs> when dealing with data that you need to understand, right? So people have tried for a long time to label reads without having to assemble them into complete um, genomes. So let's say you had some reference genomes. This is genes in these genomes, function one, function two, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you have reads that you get from your metagenome data, you try to align them to these, um, these genes because you assume these reads come from genes that you haven't seen before in, in this new, in this other organism, right? So one way to assign the function to this organism's gene is to align this read to these um, actually re referenced genes, right? So if this aligns that that gene has the function of F3. Uh, if that aligns, then this gene has a function of F1 and so on and so forth. So people have been doing this for a while. Uh, there is a few issues with this transfer, but you know that, that's the way that you would do it. And so the idea really is that um, if you could do this alignment, you could uh, get some understanding of what functionality is encoded in a particular metagenome data. So people have used BLAST for a very long time, just because it was available or it is available, right? Um, we built a method, Chen Cheng Zhu in my lab had built a method called MyPhaser. Um, and MyPhaser, you could see, for those of you who are used to looking at graphs, that precision and recall of MyPhaser is significantly better than BLAST. So great, we could do annotations. Here's a problem, BLAST or no BLAST, uh, we are limited by the number of sequences that we have as references that have annotations. So I told you before that uh, only a very small number of sequences have annotations. Now this is a little um, aged, so I haven't gone back to look for more numbers, but um, about three years ago, there were 21,000 sequences for which we actually have experimental annotations of catalytic activity. Only 21,000. We're talking about 37 million sequences that are currently available, right? So we only have 21,000 annotations. So out of 30, 32 million sequences, 32 million sequences. And uh, actually, if we take these annotations, so EC numbers is catalytic annotations, um, and we compress that to a space which actually is uh, representative of experimentally annotated EC number. So there's only 2,000 functions that we're talking about, right? 
And that basically translates into being able to annotate 2% of reads, 2%, right? So this is not two books out of the entire library, but 2% of reads is a tiny number. Okay. Um, yet we can do things with them. So for instance, if I can translate every microbiome, so every row here is a microbiome, into the quantitative number of functions, so a description of how many reads map to a particular function, right? So one microbiome has two reads that map to function one, five reads that map to function five, and so on and so forth. I can describe that space. I have a class that I know this is assigned to. It's a healthy person or sick person or whatever. And I can compare the vectors that represent these individuals, right? And so what we did, for example, for horizon um, oil, deep, hori deep horizon, oil spill, the one, see, you forget names immediately. Um, the oil spill that had occurred um, uh, now 10 years ago. And what you look at is the microbiome of the sand uh, that was affected by the spill. So you see that the oil microbiome functionality is similar to the post-oil microbiome functionality, but both are different from the pre-oil microbiome functionality, right? So basically, if I were to put it into a two-dimensional space, I could say, look, we had no problem here. This is pre-oil, right? Then something happened and we've migrated to another side of the graph, right? With the oil spill, we're getting a whole bunch of other functions in these organisms. But then as oil gets removed and degraded, we're sort of moving back to where we were functionally wise. We may not be moving back in terms of the actual organisms, right? But we are moving back in terms of the functionality that these organisms do, right? Um, and the, the same way you can look at uh, disease, yeah. So the functionality has changed with the oil spill? Yes. The organisms have also changed? Probably, yeah. And how do you, you say that it's the organism? It's, uh, it's the functionality that is changed, but not organism. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the organisms haven't changed. I'm saying that the things that... So the way to change functionality is either to upregulate the number of organisms that carry out a particular function, right? Or to eliminate the organisms and replace them by something else, right? So what we are seeing here is that the functions, it says this says nothing about organisms, this is just functions, right? So the functions that were present in the pre-oil environment and natural environment are very different from the functions that are present after the oil spill, right? But the functions that are present in post oil spill world, so when, when the system is recovering, look somewhere halfway between the two. So mm -hmm. what's happening in terms of actual organisms, I don't know, but I do see that there is a functional- Is it possible that it's just selective surviving based on like oil spill that's like causing some organisms to get killed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So. Uh, the, the thing with microbiomes is that it doesn't help you to know who is there, right? It helps you to know what are the quantities of them and what are they doing, right? So we all walk around with a bunch of organisms that are deadly if you allow them to proliferate, right? And yeah. Okay. So, um, so you can do this with uh, disease as well. So we have a family here. There were two people in this family who have Crohn's disease. But we're looking at the myocarbiota, and you see, actually, the Crohn's disease patients are very different from, from everybody else in this family, right? Um, that's probably not surprising to those of you who study the gastrointestinal tract, right? Because there is a lot of stuff going on with uh, Crohn's disease. But there is also some interesting signal that you could see. So, for example, this married couple over here, SO7 and SO8, they are the closest to each other in, in, in terms of the, their microbiome functionality, right? Uh, what you also see is that uh, these children, so SO5 and S10, right? Uh, they're female children of about the same age. Even though they're not in the same household, they are close, 
And both of them are further away from SL4, who is the boy over here, right, who lived in the same household as the SL4. And it's an interesting observation that there is some relationship with host sex, um, persons, sex, and age, right, in the, in the microbiome world. Now, it's a tiny family, so I could be making all kinds of inferences here that's not going to stand up. But we see this consistently across, across other data sets. So um, what I've been telling you is that I can just compare these vectors. But I could also train a model right, to try to recognize whether a particular vector is somehow representative of a particular class. And we did this um, with uh, the data set that we got out of a 2012 study um, on a Chinese cohort of type 2 diabetics versus healthy individuals. And uh, training that model with the microbiome functionality as defined, as we have defined it, remember, still 2% of the data, right? so not very much. But it's, it's actually a fairly decent model, right? So we get uh, the area under the curve of about 0.74, being able to tell whether a person has diabetes or doesn't have diabetes. So there is a difference between diabetic and non-diabetic patients in, the, in this cohort. But again, the 2%, we want to look at 100%. And now, since we're so inspired by, by this momentous advance in machine learning, right, um, we decided to, to do some work with that. Now, this is not the transformers. Um, this was before transformer hit mainstream in biology. So we did work with long, short-term memory neural networks. It's another form of deep learning, different form, very different from transformers, but also very interesting. And so what a postdoc in my lab, Adrian Horfrost, had done is she encoded the metagenome data, the read data, into this latent space, just simply representing it as a vector once again, right? But now it's not a protein vector, it's a DNA vector of a short read. So every read can be interpreted as a vector of 104. So that's important, why? because I can now use these things, these vectors, to train models. So for instance, she trained a model to recognize my phaser labels. This is the ones that we have to do by alignment before. But she could also train it directly on the experimental annotations of the proteins that are encoded by these particular genes. Right? So it's, this model works fairly well when we try to predict uh, the higher level catalytic activities whether it's an oxidoreductase, a hydrolase, or whatever. Um, this looks fairly good, right? So there's very, very high precision in this annotation. And it actually looks that way at every level. For those of you who are familiar with enzyme commission annotations, the finer the level you go, the closer the similarity is, right? So a particular type of an oxidoreductase is uh, at level three. So at first level, at second level and at third level, these are actually quite good at recognizing functional activity. But again, so this is recognizing my phaser labels, which is driven by sequence homology. So it's not that interesting, right? And so we asked, can we recognize things that are not homology driven, that are not sequence similar? And this is what she found. If she was to take a Terra global ocean microbiome, so this is uh, a cruise, Terra is a cruise that samples. I want to go on this cruise. You just ride around and you sample the ocean and then you determine what's, uh, what's there, right? So which bugs are there. That's great. It's a wonderful effort. Um, there's a lot of data that's generated that we cannot annotate. So here's my phaser with its annotations. The stuff in, in orange and blue is annotations of oxidoreductase activity. We cannot annotate 98% of the reads. MGRAST is a different method for doing annotations, but still sequence homology based. Uh, it's much looser than my phaser. Can annotate about 30% of the data. This is what looking glass. It can annotate 100%. And the first question that people ask is, how do you know it's right? right? It's not homology based. How do you know it's right? So we evaluated this um, using environmental signatures. Mm -hmm. So you expect a particular type of concentration of uh, um, oxidoreductases in the minimum oxygen zones of the ocean 
versus the surface of the ocean. And the only method that actually gives you what we expect is, is the, our method. So these, these methods don't have sufficient ability to recognize axidoreductase activity in a way that is uh, supposedly there. So the conclusion of, of this thing is that uh, there is some signal that is not sequence driven that the looking glass captures, right? And we decided to evaluate what that signal is. Um, so this just for comparison, the blue color here is homologous genes, genes that we know are homologous. But if you take, uh, let's say a piece, a read of the gene from the first part of the gene versus the last part of the gene, two reads may not be homologous to each other, probably are, right? So if you try to align two pieces of this gene, um, you're probably going to get very little sequence similarity. Yet for some reason, the embedding space actually captures similarity between this. So if you look here, this uh, concentration here, which uh, describes high embedding similarity, right? But low sequence, sorry, <laughs> low sequence similarity, right? We get a lot of homologous sequences there, right? So if you try to look uh, at the relationship between sequence similarity, which is this distribution over here, versus the embedding similarity, which is this distribution here, there is very little of it, right? So there is some. It's not not there, right? But it's not very obviously related. So we asked the question, what if we trained, uh, what, sorry, what if we used looking glass, not as a predictor of functionality, but simply compared reads without any functional annotations? Would we get any meaning out of it? And here's a, an interesting observation. In fact, uh, the colors here represent metagenomes taken from different spaces. So wastewater sludge versus human gut versus soil and so on and so forth. And you could see that the blobs on the screen in this space are actually one color or primarily one color, which suggests that these reads that come from the different spaces in embedding land are very different. Right? And that's a, a very interesting observation because we don't know what their function is, right? But we know that this separation is not sequence driven or not explicitly sequence driven. Okay, so I asked Prabha, <laughs> can you do this for human body sites? And, and what he told me is that actually it doesn't separate as well. And in fact, it doesn't separate as well because guess what? The human host is a pretty stable environment, regardless of where on the human host you live, right? Yes, there is going to be differences, but it's not as obvious as it is between, let's say, sludge and soil microbiome. Right? So even though it's not as obvious, you still see that there is a bunch more gum microbiome functionality over here, right? This is the vagina floor over here that's sort of hanging out by itself. And then there is a, a mix there that's primarily pinkish and red. So that's the gut, right? So even though we can't differentiate it, obviously, it is differentiable. Right? without knowing anything about what the functions are that are being carried out in there. And here's the fun part. If you ask the question, can you differentiate sick people versus healthy people? You see here, for example, the green reflects people with um, IBD, with like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, right? This is healthy people. You could see that these are quite distinct. This is pre-diabetic people versus healthy people. Now, arguably, pre-diabetic people are still healthy, right? They don't have diabetes. Right? So there is some more overlap than here, but you could still differentiate microbiomes. And what's actually stunning to me is that within the pre-diabetic cohort, they seem to be clustering together, right? Um, and if I ask this question from functional annotation, so this is not annotations, not functional annotations. This is all reads, right? If I ask this question from functional annotations, I could still do it, but I do it much worse. So it dilutes the signal that we have had. Okay. 
So took a little longer than I wanted to take, but in conclusion, uh, function is key. I hope you guys agree with me, uh, but we need to learn to work with functions that we don't yet know because otherwise we're losing out on a lot of data that's available. Machine learning can transform data into knowledge in ways that we probably haven't thought of before. Um, and realistically, it's just too much data not to be using computers to do this stuff. Um, deep learning probably has some suggestions to your questions, to answers to your questions, but you really need to stick to biology. You need to know what you're doing. You can't just you know, throw everything in and hope that it will work. It's not going to work this way. Um, and actually, you know, when I give this talk, usually people don't ask me about the details of machine learning as been cut did in the beginning. So normally I just drop the technical stuff and nobody notices it. Right? So this is a, an interesting observation. The biology understanding needs to come first. <clears throat> I'm advertising, I'm looking for students, postdocs, collaborators. If you, want, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. And of course, I don't do any of this stuff. This is the people that do the work or the, some of them used to do the work. And this is the people who pay for it. Jana, thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. And I'm sure you're going to get a lot of new collaborators out of this talk. Thank you. I hope so. Yeah, I have some questions. So let me ask you, I mean, a very practical question. I was looking at the, at the data on microbiomes and diabetes, pre-diabetes. So yes, uh, the microbiomes predict diabetes well, but is it, do we know which came first? I mean, have the microbiomes changed because of change in glucose or are the microbiomes changing the glucose uh, and causing diabetes? So in other words, which is cause, can you tease out cause and effect from the, from these data? This is a, an excellent question, Venkat. Uh, I mean, in, I would argue that in biology, you could never tease out cause and effect. Um, unless someone goes and breaks a leg, uh, there is really no, no cause and effect. Uh, but you could talk about things that may be contributing to a particular status. So the earlier figure that I showed of uh, classifying sick, so diabetic people from healthy people. There, the question can very well be what came first. And I agree with you. I think that uh, there is uh, less to be had there in terms of what was uh, the cause and what was the effect. But here particularly, I didn't recognize it at the time when we started looking at it, but uh, the, the fact that it's pre-diabetic patients, they are not diabetic yet right? Yep. Suggests to me that uh, the microbiome, well, you could argue that the microbiome is already on the way, like an early warning signal. But I, I have a feeling that also a likely explanation is that uh, this is uh, the, the microbiota contributing to the observed phenotypes. Okay. Right? Good. So, sorry, go ahead. So one other question again about, I mean, I agree with you that you've convinced us that functionality is the most important thing. But two questions are propping in my head about functionality. First is, how much of, when you look at proteins or when you look at bacteria or whatever, how much of the proteins are truly functional versus, is it a very small uh, percentage of proteins that are truly functional and the others are redundant in a system? And my second question related to that is, particularly I was thinking about the oil spill and how it changed the uh, the the protein structure is it was all that uh, the, the oil spill was doing was altering the homology and then after the oil spill went out the homology returned. So uh, I have to think about the second question. So I'm going to answer the first question first. Okay. So so the idea here. Um, sorry, I had a wonderful answer and then I got lost with the thinking about the second question. Can you repeat it's, it's the It's about redundancy. Okay. Redundancy, that's right. Um, so the redundancy in bugs, in microbes, is actually quite limited by their survival abilities. So bacteria don't like to have proteins that don't do things. 
right? So they want they will get rid of them. They will lose them very easily if uh, it costs them energy to translate and they never use them, right? So bacterial genomes are a lot more optimized in terms of lacking redundancy than human genome is, for example. Yeah. So that's uh, that's less of an issue, I would say, here. But with regard to the structure, the homology of organisms in the oil spill data, um, I'm not really sure what we mean by homology of organisms. So what what I'm showing is the functional abilities of the individual microbiome samples as compared across uh, different environmental spaces, right? So in an oil spill microbiome, there has to be, but there doesn't have to be, but there will be a preference given to microbes that can use the oil for their growth advantage, right? Mm -hmm. And they then they can continue to live there, but in much smaller quantities because the oil is not available. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, so when the oil goes away, so so when the, uh, do they just return to their original positions? That's what I meant. You know. Because uh, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, it could be, it could also be because of the rampant horizontal gene transfer in microbes that uh, they, the particular species that initially started out as being favorable in a particular environment has transferred some of its genes to somebody else. Yeah. And at that point, you don't actually know anymore who is the guy responsible. And this is actually one of the reasons I really don't like the question of who is there, right? Because in bacteria, it's very hard to say. <laughs> It's kind of, if you have half a genome of somebody else, are you still the same guy? 